now and he'll be home tomorrow. So we'll be continuing. There is a meeting in, Toronto, in Montreal, uh, the 15th, it begins, uh, on the whole matter of international uh, air regulations. Mm -hmm. And we'll see what comes out of that. Then. Now, I have to ask a question too about Lebanon. Um, the backup of the Marines. You gonna keep them in there? You gonna pull, pull them out? What are you gonna do with our Marines over there in Lebanon? Well, the function that they were sent in there for, along with the whole multinational force, that was one that, anticipating that we would then be able to remove the foreign forces, and we did with Israel, but not with Syria, that then to enable Lebanon, the government of Lebanon, to put together its own military and take over its own uh, territory, that the multinational force would be there, you might say, behind their forces to help create stability while they were going to take over. I don't know that any of us anticipated uh, what we're seeing now or to this degree. So they are still there in that mission. One thing is we have, and this is true of all the multinational forces, we have in, assured uh, them that we're going to protect our, our people. I heard on the television this morning that there had been some naval bombardment of uh, gun positions. This morning, the uh, uh, the French were doing some in response to their reconnaissance yesterday, but we uh, had uh, shore batteries with the Marines mm -hmm. and uh, one ship, and we, uh, I don't know what has taken place since then, but uh, they they silenced uh, <laughs> the guns. Right. This is going to be a continuing policy to take out the artillery weapons? We're not going to put anybody over there and not let them defend themselves. In the meantime, we're doing our best to convince Syria that, uh, and getting our Arab friends to also do their best to influence them, to get them to... Are you making them. any progress, though, toward getting the Syrians out of them? I'll know more when we uh, hear from McFarland, who has just been in Damascus. And I think I uh, was trying to get out of there yesterday. I was trying to remember how long it's been, but I think it's been about a year, has it, since you set this whole peace project in motion in there? Has it been that long? It, well, let's see, it was a year ago that I announced the whole peace plan. Yeah. Now, when the Marines must be pretty, pretty much, we could say safely, a, a year, then mm -hmm. couldn't have been too long afterward that they went in. You're disappointed that nothing more has happened than has happened? Well, I think all of us were optimistic that it would ha have happened sooner. Yeah. Uh, and there's been foot dragging in a number of places, including the Lebanese government itself, uh, in uh, trying to broaden the base of the government because they do have the problem of uh, that their own laws deal with with regard to the mix of the Maronite Christians, the, the uh, various uh, Muslim sects. That's S-E-C-T-S, not I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Can you look ahead six months um, in Lebanon? What would you see? Syrians still there? The country I'd be, afraid, yeah, I'd be afraid to try and yeah. look ahead. Mm -hmm. Tough one. A lot of tough ones for you to play. Yes. Okay. Now, and let me come home. Um, I did a column the other day on this gender gap business. Talk to me about this gender gap. Is it growing? Is it exist? Is it getting worse? Better? What do you propose to do about it? Well. We're going to, I think what we really need to do is not so much uh, an improvement over what we have been doing, except that nobody knows what we have been doing. What we need is uh, for more understanding. Now, and this wasn't a last minute thing, uh, as so many have implied, uh, for political reasons. We had been very successful in California in reviewing state statutes and getting laws changed mm -hmm. where there was actually built-in discrimination in the law. Uh, for example, we found we had a law that said that uh, a wife with her own money uh, couldn't invest that money without her husband's permission. No. Uh, we didn't get it repealed? Or? Uh, yes, right. we, we changed those. Now, when we came here, the first thing I did was ask the 50 states, I wanted someone here to work with them, to ask the 50 states 
to set up something in the States to bring about the same thing we did in California. Well, what response did you get? Not a very thorough response. All 50 of them yeah. appointed a, a representative to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, in a number of the states, uh, well, it's like it would, like you could imagine it would be. It's been faster in some than in others. Mm -hmm. Some of them have been rather successful, uh, some of them are pretty slow at it. We're continuing to press on this. We can't order them, after all. They are sovereign states. But then here in Washington, we set out with this plan of having the Justice Department do it with regard to federal laws. Right. And this was a, uh, it's a laborious process to go through all the laws and everything. And we've had three uh, reports back from the Justice Department. Now, I'm familiar with the first quarterly report. The second one was a very small one, as I understand it. And I have not yet seen the third quarterly report. Well, the third quarterly report is the one that contains the information mm -hmm. that uh, I think I'm correct in this. If I'm off one or two, uh, it's, it isn't any more than that. That 27 laws have already been corrected. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 more will be corrected when Bob Dole's legislation passes because we have sent up uh, the, the findings on 60 more. Mm -hmm. We're having a cabinet meeting uh, as soon as uh, this is over, at 2 o'clock uh, on uh, the subject of the uh, of the balance of about uh, one other 65 or more laws to make the decisions on those because now some of those uh, we probably won't want to correct because they're laws that actually provide advantages for women that are not provided for men and that we think are justified. Now some of the women's leaders don't want these advantages. Well, that's no, but um, I think you have to rep I think you have to recognize in some instances, such for example as labor laws, yeah. uh, that women and men uh, are different well, with uh, regard to physical strength and so forth. Yeah, forth. most states have laws uh, about how much weight you can lift yes. and so on. But now let me be sure I have my count straight. Twenty seven federal acts already have been corrected. Yes. Sixty more will be corrected under Bob Dole's bill. Yes. And then you have another 60 or so that you have not done. Yes, and they're continuing, of course, to look. But under this bunch, we're discussing these this afternoon uh, in a cabinet meeting with the Justice Department mm -hmm. in charge and present, making the presentation. Right. Now, on top of that, uh, there are the other things that I know are well known, but uh, we, at this point, are ahead of the previous administration in the employment of women. We have, for the first time in history, three women at one time in our cabinet uh, and of course we all know that it's the only time there has ever been a woman in the on the Supreme Court uh, but more than that we have appointed 1,200 women in executive and policy making uh, positions and I think that this uh, compares favorably or better than any previous administrations and we're continuing to make that. Well then why do you experience this hostility? from these leaders of the women's groups? Well, for one, Jack, because they don't know these things or they're not paying any attention to it. And I think basically it's because I don't happen to believe that the ERA is as good an answer as what we're doing. Now, it sounds very simple and easy, uh, a, consti a constitutional amendment. Uh, what did I say, ERA? E, yeah, yeah. Equal yeah. Rights Amendment. Equal Rights Amendment, yes. I want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> um, the, uh, as I have viewed it, and I am not a lawyer myself, but I've sought legal advice on this back when I was a governor and would, was going to be faced with it there in California. This will put in the hands of the courts what I think can be handled in legislation. And it doesn't simply guarantee it. What it does guarantee is that if someone thinks they're being discriminated against, they'll have to go to court to get a settlement. Well, I think changing the laws makes a lot more sense, where it's just specific and right there in the law. But I think that this is part of it. You haven't been able to persuade some of these more militant women, though, from no. that point of view? No. But also, uh, Jack, the, the other thing is, I don't have anything to do with whether a constitutional amendment is passed or not. Well, they try to do it, so they haven't been able to get it passed. That's right. And uh, I suppose it'll come out. Did you happen to read that transcript of the 
the um, Songus and the Orrin Hatch. When, uh, oh, oh, it was something. Yes. About Songus had no answer except let the courts decide what it means. Yeah. And he said it over and over. It was well, pretty strange coming from a legislator also that uh, he just wanted to let the courts make all the decisions. Yeah. Now, do your pollsters indicate that uh, this gap, so-called, was getting worse? I, don't, I haven't seen any indication of that. Am I right or wrong? <coughs> uh, Worthland's Worthen, numbers do not show a, a broadening out of Gallup has shown some. But Worthland's don't. Uh, I said in a column I wrote the other day that I'd like to see a survey done of those women who voted in 1980 who voted for you and find out how many of them have decided they would vote against you um, if you ran That'd be again. a pretty interesting one. I'd like to see that myself. Wouldn't it be an interesting to see what the switch is? Wouldn't you think it'd be, a, it'd be pretty small? I, if any at all. Jack, a, an example of this is the other day when I went over to render that apology that yeah. then kicked up the fuss, the caveman. Well, I have to tell you, the only person that I recognize in that room, well, or found out afterward, felt was the woman that I had called and made the arrangements through, Polly Maidenwald. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have asked for a better reception. Mm -hmm. I walked out to a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, even she, with every opportunity to have laid into me, she was smiling and warm and friendly and thanking me profusely for having come over. And within the hour, I called a press conference and was kicking my brains out. Uh, you're going to push for this bill of Bob Dole's to get that uh, oh, yes. through? Yeah. Most of those 60 statues that are covered by Bob's bill though, are, are pretty innocuous, aren't they? Many of them. And, but what they take, many of them can be corrected simply by changing one word. Change it from men or women to persons. Mm -hmm. And it'll solve all the problem. In the, in the, the law doesn't have to be changed. Well, he mentioned one of them to me the other day that I, I mentioned in my column. It had to do with members of the Ute tribe of Indians, a statute passed around 1850 somewhere, that the Ute Indians could be moved from one reservation or one piece of land to another only with the consent of the adult male members of the tribe. <laughs> well, the statute hadn't been invoked. I mean, it's been lying there on the books for 130 years or so. Uh, so they're going to repeal that. But well, I asked for a typical statute, and I have to tell you, said that was, most of them were about that level of importance. Listen, before we get off this, let me just, I left out some things too about what we've done. And it goes very back to the very beginning. The first thing we ever tried to do when we came here, of course, was the economic program. Well, in tax-wise, we have virtually eliminated the marriage penalty and the income tax and the widow's tax in the state, or the inheritance taxes. Um, we have almost doubled the tax credit for child care for working wives. We've made changes in the pension laws. Uh, economically, we have, and I think uh, in the economic recovery, we're seeing that what we did was most beneficial uh, to them because last month when that biggest decline in unemployment in 24 years took place, it was a bigger decline for women workers than it was for men. Their, their rate of unemployment is much lower than the men's and lower than the average. Right. Well, now, that kind of carries me into the, the next area I wanted to ask you about, to do with federal finance and these deficits. What's going to be done about it? How do you feel about this idea of a commission to make recommendations on what to do about the deficits? Uh, no, I think, I think the economic recovery that is showing up as better than uh, we had predicted or than anyone else had predicted is a large part of the answer to the deficits. But the other one is we've never been as successful as we should have been and that we must be in persuading the Congress to cut spending. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think that a commission, uh, uh, they could come in with recommendations about tax increases and so forth. But the history of tax increases shows they're not, they don't cure deficits. We had, we doubled the taxes in the five years from 76 to 81. 
And in those five years, we have $650 billion worth of deficits. Now, the, we think the economic recovery and a tax increase would certainly set that back. Everyone seems to be agreed on that. But right now, the deficit would be $40 billion less than it is had we gotten from Congress what we asked for in spending reductions. Right. But key members of your own party refused to go along with the spending cuts. Now, the program that we asked for in uh, January, the, the budget, and they wouldn't consider. Uh, we may not be able to stay exactly with that, but if the Congress will not give the spending cuts again that we think are necessary, I'm going to use the veto pen to bring them about. If our plan in January, when we submitted that, with the contingency tax, that could have brought us on a declining pattern. Then, granted, there are going to be big, pretty big deficits this year and next year, but it would have brought us on a declining pattern not over the next five years that you could point to a time certain in which you would balance the budget. Now, the contingency tax, I still support. This, the idea of that was because so much of the, uh, of the thing that's keeping interest rates up, for example, is pessimism about whether we can hold the line on inflation. Yeah, exactly so. And because of the deficits and so forth. So the contingency tax was put out there that if they would pass it, along with the spending cuts, it calls for that if they, we have the spending cuts, yeah. If the deficit remains above a certain percentage of the gross national product, if the recovery is solid enough at that time that uh, it cannot be set back by a tax increase, the tax would go into effect. Now, it would be passed already. By passing it already, to, no, it would go into effect 86, maybe 86. 86. The idea in, in passing it and having it there fixed would be not only for the fact that it would give people and businesses an ability to plan, they would know what the tax was going to be in advance, make their plans accordingly, but also it would reassure these pessimists in the money market about dealing with the surpluses to the place that I think we could see an even faster recovery. But don't you face for 84, 85, the almost certain prospect that there will not be significant cuts in spending. And there will not be a tax increase either? Well, now I've got to be more optimistic than that, Jack. The, uh, because I've got on my desk a letter signed by 146 representatives of both parties saying and outlining 11 specific spending areas which, if the Congress submits appropriations excessively above what we asked for in January in those, they will support my veto. That's one way of making it stick. <laughs> All right, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Let me ask you about one of these entitlement programs we don't hear much about. These price supports for farm commodities. I was reading a piece by Cliff Harden that just came over my desk yesterday. About $21 billion. That worse than food stamps. Yes. They, and you've named it. The thing is, most people never realize those are entitlement programs based on 1977 and 1981 legislation, the farm bills. Yeah. Those were based on anticipation of continued high inflation. And the result has been that those things just kept going up because of what had been passed. Now, we had bumper crops in 81 and 82 that reduced the prices because of the surpluses, and we, what we must have at the very least is a freezing at the present level of those price supports, uh, because now the prices have gone back up on farm products. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be good if they could be reduced below the level they are, mm -hmm. but it was the fact that that legislation anticipating inflation just pay the prices too high. 
build in a price support that... Uh, it's pretty difficult to defend $20 billion in Yes, it is. So, so, yeah. Well, of course, the, well, there, this PIC plan, the PIK, uh, what's your impression of that now that it's been in, uh, in effect? Well, uh, too I much success? Uh, well, I don't know whether they're doing it wrong. I thought of it, <laughs> and I think that it was, here's why I thought of it. I kept seeing the figures for how much it was costing us to keep all that surplus, to buy and, and accumulate all that surplus, and then store it. Yeah. So I said, if we've got to pay out all these payments to farmers, like for taking land out of production to soil erosion and so forth, whatever they were doing, I said, why give them the cash? Why don't we give them the crop that they didn't have and let them sell that crop in the market? Incidentally, the farmer's position also, when we talk about these farm support prices, has been benefited now by the reduction in inflation because this has made a difference to them in the cost of, of production. But um, it seemed to me, and it made a lot of sense, and they seem to be very happy with it, is if here's a fellow that had X number of dollars coming and you give it to him in a crop and say, go out and sell it. You going to continue the program? I don't know, we haven't, uh, uh, I would think that, that as long as we have to uh, accumulate such surpluses, that for such things as a farmer who loses his crop in a, uh, in a flood, in a weather disaster or something, uh, or farmers that take their land out of production because of, you know, there's a big problem today of are we eroding too fast our topsoil, things of that kind, then it seems to me it makes more sense to give a farmer a crop that he lost to go out into the market to sell mm -hmm. than to keep on paying storage on that crop mm -hmm. and give him money. But hasn't it succeeded beyond your wildest dreams? You didn't anticipate this many or this large a percentage. No. <laughs> the application started coming in, I think, for more than surplus than we had. My idea simply was when you ran out of the surplus, you, you stopped doing it. <laughs> I don't think you're at that point yet. Don't <coughs> It has it been a popular program politically in the Midwest? Apparently the farmers, uh, I was amazed, the farmers were delighted with it. Mm -hmm. So you think probably it, it will be continued then? We haven't, I can't really say because we haven't had a meeting on that to see where we go from here. But, but as, as for the cost of it, if you, uh, your thought would be to try to freeze these, at least you said, to freeze them, the, the price supports where they are. Yes. Right. Would that go for dairy products too? This, Surplus cheese is bound to be a concern. Yeah. Yeah. So we made one change there in the dairy laws. Again, Jack, I have to be honest with you, I would have to sit down with Jack Bach and our people here mm -hmm. and find out what the situation is. All I know is what I see on the television and <laughs> they talk about these enormous surpluses of cheese. You, they can't give it away as fast as they have to buy it. Well, and one of the problems was in giving it away that uh, in such quantities that you know, we have to watch that we don't suddenly make basket cases out of the, the merchants. Yeah. They're in business, we can't, right. we can't do that. Uh, the original idea, and the one that I hope we would continue with, is where you're uh, giving it to destitute people and yeah. in such a way as not to, uh, not to interfere with normal trade and business. Let me have about three minutes on politics. What's the prospect for holding on to the Senate next year? Well, I know it's going to—I know it's going to be tough. Uh, like the last time out, why we have the most seats up for grabs, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had two uh, retirements that are uh, going to be very difficult for us. Well, Tennessee is almost conceded now, isn't it, to Gore? Well, I won't—I won't give up on any of them. Uh, maybe if the recovery and all uh, uh, continues. My people will see the. Uh, the value of us having some allies here. The loss of five seats would, uh, would change it. Yeah. What's your guess? You're going to hold it? Well, I think we're going to try nationwide as a party harder than we've ever tried before to keep that from happening. You'll be out there helping um, some of these key senators to be reelected? Yeah. <laughs> you um, have anything to tell me about your own reelection? Uh, Jack, no decision as yet because. Uh, one fellow came in here from representing a magazine set where you're sitting, 
and he was the first man from your profession that ever said this, he opened the meeting by saying, I hope you will wait till the last possible minute before you make a decision and announce it. And uh, it was my own thinking to do that, and I said, well, why? And he said exactly what I thought. He said, well, if your answer is no, you're a lame duck and can't get anything done, you might as well go home now. And he said, if you say yes, he said, in the climate today, everybody will say from then on, everything you're trying to do is political and part of the campaign and you can't get anything done. Do you think that was sound advice that he was giving? I thought it was sound advice. You're going to wait a while then before letting us know. Yeah, as long as I think I can. Well, certainly before the end of the year, though, you would let us know. Well, that's probably. That gives me some time, time <laughs> frame to work in. How are you feeling these days? You're Just looking fine. good. I feel great. Good. Is that hearing aid working fine? Just great. Oh, right. Yeah. The doctor didn't actually recommend it to me, although he didn't. See, each year I go back out there. He's one of the finest in the country. And this injured ear is, does have a gradual rate of deterioration. And it's most evident in things like a state dinner or a cocktail reception or something, yeah. sorting the voice out mm -hmm. from the background noise. This year is normal and yeah. staying that way. Uh, but this time, uh, he didn't recommend it or anything, but he said, uh, maybe I'd like to see the latest state of the art. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yeah. And he held out a kind of a wax ear with this thing in it. And I, I've never seen anything so small yeah. in, along that line. And I said, let me see that. And he, he brought it out and showed it to me, told me all about it. And I thought about having something that I could put in for those state dinners and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I'll, I'll go for that. Yeah, it works. It really yeah. helps. Yeah, that's good. Want to see it? Got it. And that's all there is. That's the whole thing. Isn't that something? I remember those days of the people with the panel on their chest and turning yeah. arms and so forth. Yeah. That's it. That's the, that's the volume control. We, we used to have a member of the Virginia House of Delegates who sat on the front row of our House of Delegates, Uncle, Uncle Billy Adams. And when the debate got dull, he would turn his, his hearing aid way down. Couldn't hear a thing. Got to turn it up when he wanted to. And, uh, Uncle, Uncle Billy had the right idea. Just get that sound out of his ears. I have to tell you one of the most unkind <laughs> tricks I've ever heard of is there was a fellow on a train and in the club car the, the, the Ritz brothers were on there and years ago in the club car and evidently he kind of made a little test of himself. So the Ritz brothers started talking to him and gradually getting their voices lower and lower and lower <laughs> and he's turning up the dial and turning up the dial and finally he excuses himself <laughs> and they know to go back and get a new battery. <laughs> so that's much wrong. Well, I'm glad and he comes don't. back with this. <laughs> <laughs> and turns it all the way up. Hand away, stop! That's how I want to All right. All right, well, you're looking good. Uh, it's been almost exactly a year since I was here. Yes. At that time, you were telling me you were exercising and put on a little muscle up here. You keeping up that program? As a matter of fact, uh, I, uh, I'm wondering if I'm not going to have to get some coats changed. Ah. I can really kind of break out some seams if I <laughs> <That's> <laughs> tighten up and do that. That's no, great. I still at it. Ah, my time's up. Mr. Yeah. President, it's good to see you. See you. I am. Give my best to the family. Yeah, well, Marie came in with me. She said, not there uh, outside the hotel room, room, reading book, waiting for me. Oh, wow. Well. So, Get my best to hand say that Marines. No, it's no, it's the quartermaster that's home. Where is the Marine? Um, uh, Chris, he's at sea. He's the quartermaster. He's the number two son. He's on the destroyer Pratt. They're out right now. Oh, I thought he was the one that came home. Well, the one that came home was in the Army. He'd been in Abidjan. That's the youngest boy. He'd been in the Army for nine years in Army intelligence. Oh, I thought he was a Marine. No, he was Army. No, my, no, my number one son had been in the Marines for two years. Ah. My number one son was a Marine. My number two son was Navy. My number three son was Army. My golly, you got a lot of service <laughs> to put in the window. Well, the only one that's made, made a career out of it is um, our, our navigator, the quartermaster, the number two son. He's on the destroyer out of Charleston. Yeah. And uh, he may wind up down in Nicaragua if you send him down. Well, I hope you don't send him down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
always good to see you. So. Okay, good to see you.